The axe. It has made more real and lasting conquests than the sword of any warlike people that ever lived. But they have been conquests that have left civilization in their train instead of havoc and desolation. More than a million square miles of territory have been opened up from the shade of the virgin forest to admit the warmth of the sun. And culture and abundance have been spread where the beast of the forest lately roamed, hunted by the savage. Just a short span of history has seen these wonderful changes wrought, and at the bottom of them all lies this beautiful, well-prized, ready and efficient implement the act. Western Kentucky University, through a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, presents Kentucky Heritage. The story of crafts and traditions passed on from generation to generation. Of the Kentucky Long Rifle, a handmade reproduction of a proud gunsmith. Of the handmade piecework quilt, a labor of love by young and old. And of the traditional hand tools, such as the broad axe used by the pioneers to hew and shape logs. Traditional hand tools in Kentucky. Here to tell us the story is Kenneth Clark. Along with revival and renewed interest in the famous Kentucky Long Rifle and the beautiful handmade quilt comes another interesting phenomenon. Many people are collecting the traditional hand tools which helped build America. The broad axe, the pro with its mallet, wooden planes, the draw knife, just to mention a few. They want to own and even make things that relate to a folk culture with its satisfying crafts. Why this desire? Perhaps as we leap farther and faster into the space age, we sometimes feel disconnected from our past. We are quite romantic in our nostalgia for the slower-paced days gone by, those days when a man with pride could apply his traditional knowledge to the use of simple tools on familiar materials and carry out a whole task from beginning to end. A well-known anthropologist, Kenneth P. Oakley, wrote a book entitled Man the Tool Maker. The first two sentences in this book provide a theme which extends into our time and place. Oakley wrote, man is a social animal distinguished by culture, by the ability to make tools and communicate ideas. Employment of tools appears to be his chief biological characteristic, for considered functionally they are detachable extensions of the four limbs. Let's paraphrase Mr. Oakley and say that it seems a part of human nature to make tools, that man appears to have been making tools for about as long as man has existed. Furthermore, the skilled worker appears to enjoy making things with his hand. Here and there, the merely useful object is produced with so much attention to material and form that it becomes a kind of work of art. For example, this tool is called a sun plane and was used by a cooper or barrel maker. It's a detachable extension of the four limbs. It's all wood, except for the blade, and it would work now as well as the day it was made, though we might have trouble finding a person who knows how to use it properly. What makes it attractive is the nicely chosen wood, 
the graceful curve, the rounded corners, and the finish that brings out the grain of the wood. It also has an air of efficiency or precision about it. But now, instead of being used in a cooper's shed, it's an ornament in a study. Many tools require a kind of symmetry, balance, polish, or gracefulness if they are to function well. This reap hook derives its shape from trial and error in the grain field, but its form suggests the magic touch of a sculpture, which did not figure at all in its design. Objects such as these are in great demand. There are those who enjoy just collecting or owning things that relate to a folk culture with its satisfying craft. We recently had an opportunity to talk to a man with an outstanding collection. This is Mr. Leonard Clay of Bowling Green, Kentucky. Leonard, I know you're busy running a lumber mill here in Bowling Green. How did you happen to get started on these antique tools? This started some three years ago. We had some three or four of these old wooden planes. We hung them on the wall. Different people would come into the lumber yard and say, I've got one, I'll sell you. Or you might say, i got one, I'll give you. Or I don't want to sell one, I don't want to give it away. I'll just bring it down and loan it to you. Just leave it here with you. This uh, display here on the wall is from Bowling Green Area Vocational School. It's a very fine collection of beautiful old hand tools, and I see many there that uh, you have at the lumber yard, and I think you have some that aren't on that display there. Yes, I think so. What's that one you're working with right now? But this one here would be the type of plane that you'd use to make either wood flooring or wood ceiling. This particular plane, it would cut the tongue on one edge of the, of the piece of wood, and after you'd cut the tongue, you'd turn it over on the other side, and you'd use this plane here with the two knives in it, with the one knife in it, or rather, to cut the tongue, uh, to cut the groove. So that when you finish the two pieces, it would fit together like that and you'd have flooring or ceiling work. I see. They're fairly simple looking tools. This one here is a much more complicated looking plane, much more interesting to me. Yeah, this one here is kind of a fancy one. Uh, has the wooden screws, the wooden nuts on this side over here, the brass fittings here, and it would make a piece of molding with grooves in it like that. You'd cut just one of those grooves at a time with it, wouldn't you? You cut know? one at a time, and you can set this to, for the right depth or the distance over from the edge of the piece, however you might like to have it. It interests me that the uh, tool there has both inside and outside threads cut in wood. Yes. Uh, and it must be out of a very hard wood not to have worn out in, in this length of time. A fairly precision work in what seems to be a fairly primitive tool by our standards today. That's right. But then they dressed it up to make it kind of fancy after all. Mm -hmm. As though they valued it. Rather That's high. right. I think they did. Now here's one that looks very much like that tongue and groove set. How's that different? This one here is just to make molding. It, instead of having a little narrow flat bit, it has a bit that's cut in the shape that they'd like to have the molding so that when the product is finished, it would be in the shape of this right here. That one blade can cut that whole uh, unusual curved surface. That's right. One stroke. That's right. Mm -hmm. And here's one that uh, is curved outward on the bottom. That's an interesting looking plane. That would make what we would call nowadays coal mold. And that particular plane, when the molding was finished, it would probably be about an inch and three quarters wide. And there were several different sizes of them to make different sizes of molding, small to large. If a man wanted to do all kinds of woodwork, he must have had a fairly large collection of tools like this. Yes, it's my understanding, some of the old timers has told me that if you had a complete set of them, that you'd probably have around 300 of them. And that would be a wonderful collection to have, wouldn't well, it? I'd sure love to have one like that. Now, I recognize this as an ads, but I believe I don't know enough about ads to know what that one would be used for. That particular adds because it's got such a short crook on it here, would probably be used for digging out like a trough into a log, or they make them even shorter than that, that you would use like making bread trays or something like that, short curve, short handle. Or if the man that hewed the log into a square post, 
wasn't what the old timers called a slick hewer, then they would take the ads and have to dress it up. But if he was really on the ball uh, and did a good job, they called him a slick hewer because he did such a good job of it. Then you wouldn't need an ax to follow, or an ads rather, to follow up. That's right, you wouldn't be no need for the ads. Now I, I've seen tools like this, but it seems to me they had only one piece running through the block there rather than two. Some do, some have the two. Uh, this particular one, they call it a scribe. It has the two. You can't see it right here, I don't think, but it has a little metal pin there and one on this side. And you would set it with this thumb screw here and this one over here. Like the way this one's set now, that if, if you passed it along the edge of a board, that little pin would make a mark over there at two and a half inches so that you could rip that piece or cut it straight through. And this one over here would make a mark at an inch and a half so that you could cut it straight through. Mm -hmm. And this one here seems to do about the same thing. It's the same thing, only just on a larger scale. A barn builder or somebody like that working with larger timber would use one like that, where maybe a cabinet maker would use the small one here. Now this is a very simple one for a tool. Looks about like a clothespin. Well, in a sense, it's a clothespin, but uh, my dad called it a preacher. That's what they tell me that it was. I guess because it's supposed to told the truth about where you made a mark. You would use it like in putting on weatherboarding, where you'd place it up to get in the corner or whatever this weatherboarding was gonna join. And at whatever angle you set this, and you made a mark on this side over here, and you cut your piece of timber like that, then it would fit the same angle over on this side. Or you would use it to hip hold like if you were putting up ceiling, and this would slip over that that was already there and have to hold up this end of this piece until you got down there to nail it up. Back then, they didn't have too much help, not like they do nowadays, but they had a preacher to help them. That's just part of an interesting and extensive collection of hand tools. Now, whether you're making an ax handle, sawing at a bench saw, or just whittling, Wood is one of the few materials you work with. As a matter of fact, we become more aware that the pioneers of the American frontier operated on what could be called a wood technology. Wood and the need for tools to manipulate the wood were of prime importance to early settlers. The forests were a major challenge in the needs of the pioneers. And along with this challenge came a special nature lore special tools, and special techniques. These served to give the pioneers a self-confidence and satisfaction in their crafts. Basically, land had to be cleared of trees for use as farmland and space on which to build houses. The felled trees were then used in the form of logs to construct houses, along with barns, sheds, fences, and so on. People of today continue to marvel at the ingenuity of the pioneer who used basic hand tools to construct a house. The log cabin, a traditional home in Kentucky, was and still is a creation of rustic beauty. You might wonder, how could a person build a cabin such as this by hand? What kind of tools did he use? Let's talk to a man who has actually built a log cabin with hand tools. This is Mr. Ben Harrison of Bee Spring, Kentucky. Mr. Harrison, sometime in his 82 years, has built a log house with traditional hand tools. Tell me, Ben, what did you use for tools? Well, I used broad axe to hew the logs with. A broad axe like this one? Yeah. And you, you hewed the logs? The logs. Well, could you tell me how you hew a log with a broad axe? Well, the first you use buckham. This is uh, just the tools you're going to use, use is that yeah. right? Yeah. What kind of tools? Then? Tools, you use a, a small broad axe and wedge to buckham with and mm -hmm. to split the slabs out. Now, and what are you doing now? Chopping that. Well, buckham the log to make it straight. Bucking the log to make yeah. it straight. Now I've been driving a wedge in it to get that slab off, you see. I see. Do you do that to both ends of the log? Both ends of the log, yeah. If that is, if the 
one end maybe it ain't got much slab on, they can fill it off with a, with a uh, roll axe. And what are you doing now? Scoring it. Score it about 12 inches apart, just hard and as deep as you aim to hew it. And you use a double bitted axe for that? Double bitted axe, yeah, or any kind of chopping axe for that. Well, you have to be careful with your toes on that well, scoring. Well, not, not in particular. Now I see you now picked up the broad axe. Now he's to hew it. Those are big chips you're knocking out yeah. of the log there. Well, that's them as long as they, uh, see now he's putting that under the other, keep the axe from getting dull, hitting it in the ground, you know. Or oh, you put a piece of wood underneath, underneath there for the there. axe to hit if it goes on through. Mm -hmm. uh, you must have to have a very sharp axe to it make such big chips. It needs to be real sharp. General always sharpen your axe about, oh, if you make it tie, it's about uh, ever three or four days. Take it to the grindstone grind it. Now, if, if you were making cross ties for a railroad, would this be the way you'd do it? That's the way you'd do that, and you'd cut the other side just the same as that. And if it was big enough to square, then you'd turn it down and do the edges the same way. And if it was counted to pole tie, you'd take your chopping axe and peel the bark all off, and uh, that'd be a pole tie, you see. And if you were making a house, this would be the way you, to square well, it off? Well, if you're making a house, you'd, uh, you'd uh, just uh, take two sides of it off and put the house up in without taking the bark off. Now this is the tool, and you have to be very accurate in the way you use it, don't you? you yeah, that's same... right. You want to hit in the same place. You don't want to ruin the looks of it. Would you consider this to be a good example yeah, of a Yeah, that, that's a good bow axe. That's a right-handed bow axe. Now, now what, the handle is right-handed. What do you mean by right-handed? Well, it's, uh, <coughs> you see, this side's flat and this side's flat. You take it and it's that flat. Now, if you wanted to make a left-handed handle, you'd take the opposite side of the sapling that you made this handle out of and make it just like this handle but you'd put it on in this side of the axe. And then that way, it'd be a left-handed axe. That's so that the flat side of the axe is against the flat side that's of the log. That's right, that's right. What about the roof of a barn or well, a house? Roof boards. You take, uh, I've made a lot of boards, and here's the tools you use that after you get it cut into stays. And you uh, split them and make the boards. That's a fro and a mallet. A fro and a mallet. Now, uh, what, what's that piece he's setting in there? Well, now? that's a piece of the, of the stave that he's fixing to split. And he put the fro on it? Fro, fro on it and, and drive it in until it comes as far as he can drive it, and then he presses it. Well, that's why that long that's handle why sticks that up. That's why long handle made that way. See, he, he, he splits it. He's got leverage to Lever split. To split it with. Some timber splits heap easier than others. Some's tough, but it, some of them splits easy. See, that, that seems pretty good, pretty good splitting timber. What, what kind of wood would one use well, to make that kind of a... Well, of course, a good white oak would be, make off a good shingle board, but I generally always use blue skin or underhill oak. Blue skin called. or underhill oak? Underhill oak, oak yeah. What That's a that? close bark timber. What we see here is that the traditional worker had a great deal of traditional knowledge about kinds of trees, kinds of wood, the qualities of the wood, how it would work, what it was good for, and so on. We have some samples here. What about that sample? That's uh, a, a walnut. That's uh, furniture timber. That makes good furniture. And you could tell this tree as you walk through the woods well, by the bark, oh, yeah. couldn't you? With the bark. Yeah. What about that next one? Well, that's uh, a poplar. That's uh, uh, awful good building timber. What part of the building would you well, use? Well, any of it and all of it. That, mostly the old weatherboard, and that really makes better weatherboard than any kind of uh, lumber. Holds up well. Holds up well. well. Holds paint good. This is a po post timber. Put that in, uh, in fence post. What kind of tree is that? That's a locust. And locust is good for fence Good bowls. fence bowls, yeah. I suppose it doesn't rot. No, don't rot.
This, this here is a white oak. That's a very valuable timber that was made in my day, was uh, made the best ties of any timber. It's lasting. And it makes good barrel stays. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's good, lasting timber. Strong timber. Strong timber, yeah. Now That's a sugar tree. It grows in hollers, most usually. And it uh, makes good furniture. And it also is good to help make sugar, molasses out this of it. This is where we get our maple syrup. The maple syrup, yeah. But also good furniture. Good furniture, yeah. From the sugar maple. What about and this kind of wood? That's ash. That's a very valuable timber. It makes good, uh, any kind of good handles of, uh, of uh, hoe handles or pick handles, why shovel is it, handles. Why is it a good well, handle, Well, it's man? a good, stiff, strong timber. A strong timber that doesn't mm. uh, sliver or split easily. Split either. Uh, a very well-known Kentucky product that's made from ash is the famous Louisville Slugger bat. Bats used by professional baseball players are even handcrafted by turners at a lathe. Orders for professional bats are received at the Hillerick and Bradley plant in Louisville, Kentucky. In the turning room, Malcolm Gregory, a professional turner with over 20 years' experience, works with the specific model of the bat ordered and a piece of semi-finished ash stock. Precision is of prime importance as the turner carefully shapes the bat. Using the model as his guide, he proceeds to turn out a bat with the hand tools that are particular to his trade. The roughing tool or chisel is used to turn the stock into a form that closely resembles the model. Next, a sizing tool is used to cut the knob on the bat to the exact dimensions of the model. Then, using a knob chisel, the turner shapes the knob into a more familiar form. Refining the form of the bat with the finishing tool, the turner uses the calipers to match the exact measurement of the model. He is now ready to shape the barrel end of the bat. Using a measuring stick set to the exact length of the model, he scores the wood. Then with a parting chisel, the end of the bat is cut deeply, leaving only a small round to hold the bat to the lathe. Next, with the roughing chisel, he cuts off the excess wood, and with the end tool, the bat is turned into the more familiar rounded end. At this point, the turner's work is completed, except for a light sanding. The bat is then weighed to make sure it once again conforms to the model. After final sanding, the handcrafted bat is taken to be branded individually with a famous Louisville trademark and the player's personal autograph. It isn't the ordinary thing to find a handcrafted product in this modern day. The bat happens to be one product a machine can't make better. And as we move farther into specialization and urban complexity, and as we leap farther and faster into the space age, we sometimes feel frighteningly disconnected from these things of the past. No wonder we ritualize our revival of interest in gunsmithing, hand quilting, and blacksmithing. Perhaps most people are not so analytical that they discover what is lacking. Here in Kentucky, a more tradition-oriented state than most others, it is possible to find rich loads of genuine craftsmanship. But the machine has caught up, even with the self-conscious, organized, profit-motivated craft revival. The race for market lures most workers into the trap of factory methods to meet demand so that the real demand for painstaking traditional work is never truly met. Poets, if successful, find ways of expressing the fundamental yearnings of the human heart. More than a century and a half ago, William Wordsworth wrote a sonnet which contains some lines that apply to the conflict between
commerce and self-expression. He wrote, the world is too much with us. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. More than a century after that composition, Robert Frost, one of America's best known poets, set a little springtime scene entitled Two Tramps in Mud Time. Frost was chopping wood and enjoying it. Frost always enjoyed outdoor activity with his hands. He saw two tramps, probably lumberjacks between jobs, approach. He knew they would want to take over his task for pay. He resented this, for he was enjoying the feel of the ax held aloft, the feel of outspread feet on the earth, the play of muscles. However, he reflected on the money need of the tramps versus his own need for satisfaction, derived from splitting good beach blocks. He, of course, finished chopping the wood himself. Frost's conclusion was idealistic. <clears throat> he sought the union of vocation and avocation. That is, the task which is both practical and enjoyable. This he would strive for. As we multiply our numbers and continue to concentrate those numbers in urban areas, the fortunate few become fewer and fewer who can creatively combine vocation and avocation, who can see the need for a useful object and proceed to make it, and even make the tools necessary for the task. Paradoxically, man the toolmaker has succeeded so well that the force, size, and complexity of his tools frustrate his artistic impulse for they steal away that fundamental satisfaction of using a tool as a detachable extension of the forelimb. This program was produced by Western Kentucky University through a grant supplied by the National Endowment for the Humanities.